It doesn't take us long, does it, to actually recognize that we live in a world beset with problems. And on a day like today, when the, the, the sort of sea is where we see it and the sun's shining and we waltz down the road and we come here, it's easy to forget, isn't it? But actually, we live in a world beset with problems. When we think of what's happening in the Ukraine today, you think of the residents of Maripol waking up this morning, wondering if this is the last morning they'll wake up to. Our world is beset with afflictions and troubles, and it moves at such a pace, doesn't it? I mean, I can see one person in the hall wearing a mask. We've practically forgotten about the pandemic, haven't we? We're on to the next thing, we're on to the next thing, we're on to the next thing. We're seeing the world's troubles coming and coming and coming and getting greater and greater and greater. We live in this challenging world. And when the Apostle Paul wrote to the Romans, he was inspired by God, all the scriptures inspired by God, to say that we know that the whole of creation groans and labors with birth pangs until now. And so as a woman who is going to have a baby has birth pangs, and those birth pangs in become increasingly more and more difficult and awful, frankly, until such time as the baby is going to be born, that's the state of the world today, that we're seeing birth pangs increasing as the problem of sin we see around us. Now, we've thought of things broadly there that are sort of on a major global level, haven't we? You know, we sort of considered pollution, environmental problems, and war. But, but actually, and I won't ask you to reflect on this, because perhaps it's too personal. But the reality is, is that all of us in our own lives have real difficulties, challenges, and problems. We see all around us, in our families, the difficulties of, of, of broken homes. We see people struggling with jobs. We see people in real difficulty in debt, very often because they're caught up in a world of marketing where they're purchasing things that they don't necessarily really need, but actually they, they, they do it anyway because of the pressures of advertising. We see people forget that, but with very genuine problems of debt and, and the troubles that go with that, and loneliness, and anxiety, and depression. And all of these issues are in our lives. It's fair to say that there's not one of us in this room that hasn't gone through real difficulties. In fact, I can look around. And I know that just this last year, there are plenty of people in this room with real stories to tell of difficulties, being beset with personal challenges and problems. And so what I want us to do right now is for all of us to acknowledge there's a problem. If we don't recognize there's a problem, we're not interested in the solution. But I think everyone, certainly in this room and beyond these walls, can see that creation is groaning in travail. The world is in a real pickle. It's in a real state of difficulty and trouble. And so what is it that we as Christadelphians have got to offer to men and women with hearts failing them for fear of what's going on in the world. What is it that we've got to offer? Are we able to give silver and gold money to provide the solutions to people's problems? No. If we had it, it wouldn't fix it. What we can offer is this word. The word of God. And it's that that we're going to turn to now to start to appreciate what underlies this problem, the problems that we see in the world. And I'd like you to open your Bibles to the book of Genesis. And the super thing about the book of Genesis is that we can all find it, can't we? The first book of the Bible. 
the book of Genesis. And you remember the story that is presented to us, the narrative that's given to us in Genesis of how God created the world. And he created a world, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31, he saw everything that he'd made and indeed it was very good. He'd made a perfect world. And, and in that world, he placed a garden. And he put the first man and woman, Adam and Eve, into that garden to, to look after it, to care for it, and to keep it. And so we read in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 8 that the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that's pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so there was a perfect state for men and women in that garden. And Adam was able to, to walk with the Lord God, with the Elohim, that's the, the angels of God's presence, who were in that garden. And man was able to dwell with God, with the Elohim. You know this story well. Something went badly wrong. Because God didn't create man to be a robot. He didn't create man to just by default only do what he wanted. Because what the Lord God who made the heavens and the earth and you and me wanted was people who would choose of their own free will to want to know him, to love his ways, and be like him. And so in creating man like that, that allowed man to make choices. Choices for good and choices for evil. And man was told, as we just read, the tree of the life was in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and man was told that he was not allowed, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, to eat of the tree of good and evil. He was not allowed to eat of that tree. That was what he couldn't eat in the garden. And yet, we know what happened. That the serpent, who was an immoral beast, that, that, that the serpent could speak, which to us seems crazy, but a serpent does have a voice box, a snake has a voice box, and back here in uh, the book of Genesis, clearly the, the serpent could speak. We see the serpent speaking. But this serpent wasn't a sinful serpent, it was an animal. Animals can't sin. It didn't have a moral choice, but it told a lie. And it was a lie because it was, what against, it was against what God said. And the serpent said, it doesn't matter. You, you, you can eat uh, an, an, anything you like. If, if, if you eat of this fruit, you won't die. And the woman said, okay, I'll eat of it. And she gave it to the man, and the man ate of it. And in so doing, a choice was made. And that choice was to go against the commandments of God. And so sin was brought into the world. And immediately, we see in verse 9, that the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked. I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I command you that you should not eat? The man said, The woman you gave to be with me, she gave of the tree and I ate. The Lord God said to the woman, what is this you've done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate it. And so a curse was placed upon the earth, upon the man, upon the woman. And the problem of sin and sin's consequences came into the earth. And so we see to the woman, verse 16, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you'll bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband. He'll rule over you. In verse 17, we see what he says to Adam. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you'll eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. You shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. 
till you return to the ground. What's the final problem of sin? Ruth told us earlier, didn't she? Death. You will return to the ground from whence you were taken. From dust you are, and to dust you will return. And so the problem of sin is laid stark before us. And so what happens to Adam and Eve? Well, verse 23, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed cherubim, guards, as, at the gar east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword, sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And so we know this well, but man was removed from the garden. And man was separated from God. And herein lies the consequences of the problem of sin. That man is separated from God. In the Garden of Eden, when God made the world, man was able to walk with the Elohim. They were able to walk around and talk to each other, chat to each other. But because man chose to sin, chose to go against the commandments of God, man was separated from God. And that's the story of the Garden of Eden, where we see sin come into the world. And so we start to ask the question, well, what is this problem then of sin? We see that the consequence of sin is that we are separate from God, and yet there's more to it than that. I'd like you to turn to the book of Romans. Now, Romans is in the New Testament. I'm going to give you a page number once I'm there. I want you to go to Romans chapter 3. It's on page 1001. If you've got this particular Bible on you, it's on page 1001. So, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. Romans chapter 3. And we read in the book of Romans, and it's worth keeping a marker here because we're going to come to this book on two or three occasions. We read here of the problem of sin. So just go in at verse 23 where we read, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so we ask the question, what? Well, we saw that Adam and Eve sinned. And yes, we could see that they needed to be removed from the garden. But the consequences of sin were put on the earth. It was put into the DNA of Adam and of Eve. And so the consequences of sin have passed on through generation and generation and generation until you come to us. And the problem of sin is still very much alive in our lives today. We see it as we reflect it in our personal lives. We see it in the state of the world today. Sin and its consequences are laid bare before the world today. And so that's why when Paul wrote to the Romans in verse 23, he was able to be inspired by God to say, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Adam's problem is our problem. There's not a person in this room that could reflect and say, honestly, well, no, I, I, I personally haven't sinned. I personally, all have sinned. It's not just Peter Owen that could have done this lecture. We all could have done this lecture, right? And, and that Greek word there for sin is, is helpful. It's the Greek word that I'll put on the screen for you here. And I'm sure I'll say this wrong, Hama, hamatano or something like that, hamatano. And that word means to miss the mark. So think about an archer who might shoot arrows. We all miss the mark. To, to hit the target is to get it right, to get it in the bullseye is to get it spot on. But the problem of sin is that we miss the mark. All have sinned and fall short. The arrows of our lives fall short. They miss the mark of what? Of the glory 
of God. And so in all of us is the problem of sin. And in all of us, we're missing the mark. We're missing that target of the glory of God. And so just scan further down the page. Because you see that a solution is starting to be found. And that's laid to us in verse 28. We conclude, and we haven't looked at all the argument, but just go with this. We conclude that a man is justified by faith. So despite the fact that we miss the mark, we can be justified, and that word justified is the idea of being made righteous. We can be made to hit the glory of God, as it were, to hit the target, to be made righteous like him, by faith. There's a real importance in all of our lives for faith, for belief. Now, I want you to turn to the person around you. And I want you to reflect. And boys and girls, this is just as important for you too. What has God provided? Or to give the children a big, bigger clue. Who has God provided as the solution to the problem of sin. Um, I think Alfie might have said me, uh, which, uh, if anyone knows his character, we all know very well he is not the solution. In fact, he's very much part of the problem. Sorry, Alf. Um, uh, oh! It's just me, Alf. Sorry, mate. So come on then, boys and girls. Let's see if someone can tell me, who is it that God has sent to be the solution? Darcy, go and shout it louder for me. Jesus. Jesus, good girl. God has sent Jesus to be the solution to the problem of sin. Well, come on, let's go to Matthew. And we all know this, don't we? It always strikes me as being incredible how crazy the whole world goes for Christmas and for getting caught up in a crazy commercial experience where all of us have to get everything. And uh, in truth, in my day job, I see families who have very little money thinking they've got to provide all sorts of things that definitely are not needed at Christmas time. And Lots of us aren't a lot better, if better at all. But in Matthew chapter 1, where we read about the story that the world remembers at Christmas, what we see is why it was that God sent the Lord Jesus Christ into the world. He sent his son. So Matthew chapter 1, in terms of a page number, it's 849 in this Bible, 849. We read why Jesus was sent. Verse 21. Mary will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So the whole point in God sending Jesus wasn't for people to celebrate Christmas in the way they celebrate Christmas. Rather, it was to save people from all the problems that we see in the world today. To deal with the problem of sin and all its consequences. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ was sent. So, when the Lord Jesus Christ then goes and preaches, and I want you to turn from Matthew now to Mark. So, the next book after Matthew is Mark. We can't go too far wrong. To Mark chapter 1. And when the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who's come to save people from his, their sins, goes out to tell people about his message and what it is that they need to do, what does he ask people to do? So John, Mark chapter 1, rather, verse 15, which is page 882, we read that the Lord Jesus went out saying, verse 15, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. 
repent and believe in the gospel. And the word believe is closely related to the word faith. You remember in Romans chapter 3, we saw that we needed to have faith. That was how we would be made righteous. That's how we would be made to be able to hit the mark that the problem of sin makes us fall short of. And so when the Lord Jesus Christ and his disciples went out, they preached, repent and believe in the gospel. What's the gospel? What is the gospel? The gospel is that you and me can have our sins forgiven. That's what the gospel is. That's the good news. That this world that we're surrounded in, or we're part of, we're all part of this problem, where sin is inside us, sin is around us. The solution is in the gospel message. That you and I can have our sins forgiven and become part of a kingdom, the kingdom of God which is at hand, which is going to completely transform this world and remove sin and all of sin's consequences, including death. And so come to the end of Mark's gospel. You're in Mark chapter 1. Come to the end of Mark's gospel, to Mark chapter 16, and to page 902, if you've got this Bible, page 902. Where, when the Lord Jesus Christ had fulfilled his mission, of course, his mission was to live a perfect life, to never give in to sin, despite the fact he could have sinned. God cannot sin. Jesus is very different to God. He's God's son. He's not God. And God cannot sin, we're told in the Bible. But Jesus could, but he never, ever did. And because he never sinned, Although he died, he was put to death by wicked men who showed the world the problem of sin, that even a righteous man, a man who had done nothing wrong, they crucified and put him on a tree. And so the Lord Jesus Christ died. The problem of sin was in him. He never sinned, he never gave in to it. He died. But because he never sinned, his father, God, raised him from the grave. He beat sin. And what's the consequence of sin? What's the ultimate consequence of sin? Aunt Jesus already told us the ultimate consequence of sin. Boys and girls, can you tell me? What does, what's the wages of sin? Sin leads to death. And so the grave, death, couldn't hold the Lord Jesus Christ because he never sinned. And so he was raised from the grave. And so following that, he said to his disciples, what I want you to do, verse 15 of Mark 16, go into all the world, go everywhere, including to mumbles and to whoever's listening online, go everywhere and preach what? The gospel, the good news that all of you can have your sins forgiven. The problem of sin can be dealt with in your life. To every creature, he who believes, remember you've got to believe, and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. And so, it's pretty stark here, isn't it? And this is the tough bit, because I've got to, sock this to you this is set out in black and white here it doesn't say to us he who believes and who tries to be a good person will be saved it doesn't say do your best every day be really kind to your neighbors and look after those around you and you'll be saved what it says he who believes and is baptized, shall be saved. And so, there's a humility required in all of us. Because you can be made to feel a bit self-conscious being baptized, where there you are, in front of a whole room of people, dressed half the time in pajamas, or a dressing gown, or something like that, and told, now, 
just relax. What I'm going to do is drown you. And you're put right under the water before coming out of the water. And you come out like a wet dog and your hair's all over the shop. Not so much a problem for some of us. But you can feel rather self-conscious. But you're telling the whole world that you realize there's a problem. And that problem isn't just in everyone else. That problem isn't just in Russia. That problem is in you and in me. And it's got to be dealt with. And the solution that God has provided to deal with it is the Lord Jesus Christ, who died and was put in the tomb and was raised again. And so what we're doing in belief and in baptism is saying, you know what? I've got a problem. I have got that nature that Adam's given me. And I mess up every day too. I'm riddled with this problem of sin. And all its consequences I see around me. And I'm going to humble myself and do as God has asked of me. And believe and be prepared to be baptized. And in being baptized, I'm associating myself with the death and the resurrection of Jesus. If you go down into those waters and you stay there, you're dead. That's why we always have a lovely, kind, baptizing brother. And so that person will make sure you don't stay there. You come out of those waters. When the Apostle Paul wrote to the Romans, to, uh, rather, he, he, he didn't write to the Romans, he was speaking, and it's recorded for us in Acts chapter 22. He recalled his own life. And he said that he was baptized by a man named Ananias. And he said that his baptism was like the washing away of his sins. And it's not that when we're baptized, we come out of the water like, oh, brilliant. I can see that sin's gone. You know, all those tattoos that I had all over me of sins, they've gone. That's not how it is at all, is it? But spiritually speaking, we recognize the problem of sin. And in our baptism, our sin is washed away. I'm going to show you a baptism. That's what baptism is. What a simple thing to do. How easy is that? How embarrassing that any of us might have so much pride that we would think, well, I, I'm, I'm not prepared to do that. That is how we show and acknowledge the problem of sin. And if we are prepared to do that, our sins can be washed away can be dealt with and something altogether wonderful is able to happen in our lives I'd like you to come on to Romans again I asked you to keep a marker in Romans did you keep a marker there I always think we've been blessed with ten fingers and one of the reasons for that is so we can use our Bible well and we can have lots of fingers in our Bible but I want you to come to Romans chapter 6 and that's on page 1003 1003 Romans chapter 6 so let's take the hypothetical situation that we've decided to be baptized because we do recognize the problem of sin. So this is super. My sins have been washed away. Well, I can just crack on then, can't I? I haven't got anything to worry about because I'm baptized. I, I don't need to worry about the problem of sin in my life. I can do whatever I like. Of course you can't. Look at Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? 
We were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so also we should walk in newness of life. For if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who's died has been freed from sin. And so what the Apostle Paul now does when he speaks to the Romans is he lays before them the challenge. And this is the challenge for those of us who've been baptised. Because we could think, couldn't we, well, I've been baptised, my sins have been washed away, super, I'm done. I've got a ticket to be in the kingdom of God that Jesus was speaking about in terms of the gospel message and the kingdom of God being at hand. Well, that's not the case. What we're expected to do, having acknowledged the problem of sin in our lives, is to keep on trying. To keep on trying to not allow sin to be the winner. And so in Romans chapter 6, it's presented to us almost like two kings in our lives. Look at verse 12. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body. So you've got a choice. You can either think, do you know what? I'm just going to give in to sin each day and do whatever that I want to do in my life. I'm just going to just... If, if I want to do it, that's what I'm going to do. Or we can try to do our utmost to, to live unto righteousness. So in verse 13, do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. By that it means ourselves. It doesn't mean the members of different people in a meeting. It means don't present yourself as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourself to God as being alive from the dead. And that your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. You are not under law, but under grace. And so the challenge for all of us is to keep trying. Keep on keeping on. For Christadelphians, we don't walk around thinking, brilliant, sin doesn't affect us. It does. All of the consequences of sin that we reflected on at the very beginning... On the world level, we live in this world. All of the problems of sin that we see on a family and personal level, they affect our families. And we have those same difficulties too. Sin is in all of us and all its consequences. But the challenge is to keep on trying our best to, to, to beat it. And it's not that we ever will. It's all, the victory's been won by the Lord Jesus Christ. The challenge for us is to share that victory and to do our best each day, to not let sin get its own way and to try to be like the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. Will you turn the page to Romans chapter 8? What the Apostle Paul goes on to say to the Romans is this. Verse 31. What shall we say to these things? Well, if God be for us, who can be against us? If we're struggling with the challenge of sin, listen. God is on your side. If you've chosen to listen to him and his solution to believe and to be baptized, he who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And so, verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Verse 37. Yet in all these things we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so though man was separated from God at the Garden of Eden, 
when sin came into the world, through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, the solution to the problem of sin, man is able to come back to that garden, to have a relationship with God. And who can separate us? If we are prepared to believe in the gospel message and to be baptized, no one can separate us from this love. The gospel message is for us all. And so, what do we do? Well, we keep on keeping on. I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 12, our last reference. Hebrews chapter 12 is on page 1070. 1,070. What are we going to do? Are we going to let King Sin win? Or are we going to really aim for King Righteousness in our lives? Well, we saw in Romans, we saw in Mark, the importance of belief, the importance of faith. And in Hebrews chapter 11, which is the chapter before the one we're about to look at, we see countless examples of men and women who went through all the trials and difficulties that the problem of sin gave to them. They had the most awful things happen to many of them, but they kept on believing, having faith. And so we're told now in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, Therefore, we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, all these examples of men and women of faith that were laid before in chapter 11, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us. It gets us down, it ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that's set before us, looking to Jesus the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so, dear friends, in Mumble's meeting room on this Saturday morning, those listening online, all of us recognise the world's got serious problems. All of us know, when we reflect on our personal lives, that the problem of sin is in us. And so we have a choice. Do we just carry on and let King Sin win? Or have you got it in you to have belief and faith in the solution that God has given you. And to show your thankfulness for that solution. First, by repenting. You acknowledge the problem. Believing and being baptized. Associating yourself with the solution that God has given to defeat death. If you're prepared to do that, then the blessings that God has offered to all men everywhere if you're prepared to accept his conditions for coming back to the garden, then you'll be able to share in a world that we believe is soon to be set up on this earth. If you think Mumbles is nice today, that's nothing. It's nothing compared to the glories of the new creation when all men and women, children, everywhere, will have their lives transformed and the difficulties of sin will be taken away from the earth. The prophet Isaiah talks of a time when the eyes of the blind will be opened, the ears of the deaf will be unstopped, the lame will leap like a deer, the tongue of the dumb will sing, for waters will burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation says that in that day, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death, no more sorrow, nor crying. There'll be no more pain. The problem of sin will be dealt with. The former things will be passed away. Do you want to be there on that day? If you want to be there on that day, 
Do something about it today.